Good morning, everybody. We are continuing the story of accountability. And today we are moving on to session 19 to look at God's consistency through Israel's dark age of judges. And that's the picture of the judges. And no prize for guessing who the lady is because she's the only lady judge. So let's go on to the lesson itself and see Israel's inconsistency. We want to compare first God's consistency in contrast to Israel's inconsistency. What we have in the story is that after Joshua's generation passed away, Israel failed to be accountable. The book of Judges shows what happened when God's people were disobedient and not accountable, that was a time that their enemies oppressed them. God withheld his protection over them, and since they were not big or powerful, they were unable to resist their numerous enemies. You can read that in Judges chapter 2 and chapter 3. And so we see Israel going into cycles of not being accountable and violating their covenant with God. But each time they were oppressed and afflicted by their enemies, we hear them crying to the Lord for help. They were unfaithful. By right, they did not deserve his help. However, God continued to be compassionate to preserve Abraham's descendants. And each time he raised a judge to save them from the hand of their enemies as long as the judge lived. So we see that if they were consistent, it was that they consistently returned to even more corrupt ways. Than before. So they were only consistent in a bad way and refused to give up their evil practices and stubborn ways when the judge died. Judges chapter 2, verse 18 and 19. Uh, these references you can read for yourself, right, when you uh, review the session, the lesson. But what they were not consistent in being accountable was to keep their covenant agreement and their relationship with God. They were not consistent, not accountable. And so we see that as God's special people, by right they should be consist consistent as God's special people. But they did not live consistent with that identity that they were God's holy people. So that is the bottom line of Israel's inconsistency. Uh, Israel did not keep to what they should be as God's people. But having said that, we see that God is good and God is consistent. All right? In contrast to his people, we find that God is consistent in his character, his work, and also his plan. He was consistent in the way he related to Israel when Israel was obedient and accountable. And that time, he protected them. Then, he was also consistent in the opposite direction in dealing with Israel, even when Israel was being unaccountable. Okay, And that is the time that he disciplined them. So we find whether Israel was accountable or Israel was unaccountable, God was consistent. When they were accountable, he protected. When they were unaccountable, he disciplined. So we see that God is good because even when Israel was naughty, being unaccountable, he was uh, looking after them. Okay? So God judged and dealt with the evil work 
and rule of the pagans. And for them, he disciplined the ungodly nations with punishment through the victories when Israel was obedient. So you see God working with the pagans and God working with Israel. And God applied consistent discipline to hold the people, whether Israel or the pagan nations, accountable with punishment, right? To teach them. So God did the same with his people when they behaved like the pagans. He also judged and dealt with his people when they did wrong. So God doesn't play favoritism with his people. And this can be frequently observed, God judging and dealing with his people when they were wrong. This can be frequently observed in the era of the judges when Israel strayed. We look at a few stories and start with Abimelech's story. Abimelech's father was Gideon, and Gideon was a judge that God used to miraculously set the Israelites free from the Midianites. And these people included the Amalekites, whom we know they were bad people, and other Eastern peoples, Judges chapter 6 to 8. So that is Abimelech's story from these three chapters. When the Israelites wanted Gideon to establish a dynasty to rule over them because he saved them from Midian, remember he was a judge sent by God, Gideon wisely said no, but he told them the Lord would rule over them. That's in chapter 8, verse 22 and 23. So he knew that he must not be king against God as the actual ruler. But what happened was after Gideon, now he was also known as Yerub Baal in chapter 8, verse 35. What happened was after Gideon died, his son Abimelech took advantage of the leadership vacuum. There was no judge, right? So there was no leader over the whole of Israel. And so Abimelech jumped in to gain support from the leaders of Shechem. And he appealed to their kinship. They said, that, oh, you know, we are related on my mother's side. And he promised them advantages. And therefore, it made them his accomplices in his wicked actions because they went along to support him in doing the wrong thing. And the wrong thing was to murder his 70 brothers to eliminate any potential rivals. And then following that, he set himself up as king over Shechem. And then he declared himself king without God's approval or legitimate right. God did not appoint him. He took it upon himself to be king. And so he seized power through violence. He killed people and he killed his 70 brothers. And he used violence and treachery with the partnership of the men of Shechem to achieve their goals. And they disregarded justice and righteousness. So we see Gideon gone, leadership vacuum, the son Abimelech took advantage of that. And the Bible makes it clear, God disapproved of what Abimelech and the men of Shechem did. So little words, little verses here, right? When we read the story, we think that, oh, all these people get to do all the wicked things and God doesn't care. Not true, huh? okay? There are little words, little indications here and there that show how God <coughs> felt about people's actions. So in Judges 9.22, after Abimelech had governed Israel three years, God sent an evil spirit between Abimelech and the citizens of Shechem. That treacherously against Abimelech. God did this 
in order that the crime, uh, you see the word crime, so the Bible makes it clear, God saw this as something criminal. Against Jerub Baal's 70 sons, the shedding of their blood, might this crime might be avenged on their brother Avimelech and on the citizens of Shechem, who had helped him murder his brothers. So God very clearly in the Bible uses a few words in there to show that he did not like what people were doing. And we find treachery and discord fomenting between Abimelech and the citizens of Shechem. And this was presented as God sending an evil spirit between both parties. So we, we tend to read this as, wow, God also can send evil spirit. God, you know, God does all the good things, but God also does all the bad things. Looks like God sent evil spirit. Okay. In fact, it was the internal conflict that started with the Shechem's acting treacherously against Abimelech. So human actions. Okay. Now, to oppose Abimelech, the leaders of Shechem set ambushes to rob everyone who passed by. And that was in Judges chapter 9, verse 24. And by doing this, they undermined his authority, Abimelech's authority, and also the stability in the region. In other words, they caused trouble, right? They caused trouble to Abimelech's reign as king. And then there was this newcomer to Shechem called Gaal. They conspired with this nobody, somebody who just came along who is new to settle down in Shechem. And they can make friends with him. And this guy openly challenged and called for a revolt against Abimelech's authority. You can read that in chapter 9, 26 to 29. Right, so you can see that the the leaders of Shechem who supported Abimelech, they were not faithful to him, right? They were treacherous, they betrayed him, and this led to conflict and then the eventual downfall of both Abimelech and the city of Shechem when they, when they started to go against each other. And we see God stepping in his divine justice in this case, was described as avenged. The crime, right, I've color-coded, the crime was avenged on their brother Avimelech. Okay, so treachery and discord was uh, color-coded green here. They acted treacherously against Avimelech. God sent an evil spirit, I've color-coded blue, between both parties, right? So, now we have the brown color. The crime was avenged on the people involved in the murder. So this gives the idea that Abimelech and his supporters did wrong, which God judged and God punished. You see, God was holding them accountable. God is consistent. He did not approve of what they were doing. And Judges 9.56, uh, this is where it goes further to say purple color-coded. Uh, God repaid the wickedness. Just now it was crime, it was avenged, and now it says God repaid the wickedness. So there is justice from God. God repaid the wickedness that Avimelech had done to his father by murdering his seventy brothers. And God also made the men of Shechem pay, made the men of Shechem pay for all their wickedness. So very clearly, the Bible does show that God is a just God, that people's wickedness uh, is known to him, and in his own time, he will deal with them. And this came as a result of the curse of Jotham, son of Jerub Baal, on Abimelech and the men of Shechem. So it is clear God, 
God acted in justice to the wrong. The Bible calls it wickedness of both Abimelech and the men of Shechem. Clearly, God held them accountable, answerable for their wickedness, and they paid for it. Now, we see Abimelech was actually not chosen by God to be a judge, but he had the charisma and the ability to be able to rally the men of Shechem. You know, sometimes you can see somebody just comes along and he manages to get people to cooperate with him, right? So these people, somehow they have that ability and to get people together. And as a son of Gideon the judge, he showed that he was in a position to do good and right with people. He was the son of the judge. So actually, if he could get people together, he should have got people together to do right. But then he chose to misuse his charisma and ability to do evil and wrong with the people that he influenced. And the result was he died a tragic death. Now, God showed through Abimelech's story that he disapproves of evil, even if it is committed by or among his people, not just the pagan nations. Even if it is done by his own people, he disapproves and he will hold the people accountable in his time. In Avimelech's case, it took three years. Sometimes we may say, oh, three years is very long. But well, when God's people are being irresponsible and unaccountable, whether actions or attitude, God will continue to hold them accountable and he will take his time according to consequences. He doesn't practice favoritism with his people even when they commit wrong, like the people who are not his people. Okay? Uh, and you, you will see in later stories that he also holds people like David accountable. Yeah. So that is Abimelech, a case that God holds this person accountable with his uh, accomplices. Then we have Samson's story. Samson's story generally showed that the judges... Uh, that would be uh, Judges chapter 13, Samson's story. Judges led Israel in a practical way rather than a spiritual way. And this practical way was to save them literally from their enemies. Samson was one of the judges that God used to deliver Israel from the hands of their oppressive enemies. And here, in this case, the enemies were the Philistines. Chapter 13, verse 1. That is the start of Samson's story. And Samson himself was specially dedicated to God from the womb. That means even before he was born, and in fact, even before he was conceived, God told his parents that Samson would be born. So he was specially dedicated to God as a Nazarite. And a Nazarite had to keep strict laws and vows because this is a special kind of uh, con uh, position as one of God's holy people. But sad to say, Samson broke his Nazarite vows. One of these vows was to avoid contact with dead bodies. Numbers chapter 6 verse 6. That's to say he cannot touch a dead body, right? And number 6.6, six, all the days that he separates himself to the Lord, he shall not go near a dead body, not even touch, not even go near. So what happened was Samson broke this vow when he touched the carcass of a lion that he had previously killed. He was going to, uh, going to do this... Uh, matchmaking with uh, with his to get his wife with his parents you know going with his parents to propose marriage to his to this Philistine girl that he fell in love with and somehow he was ahead of his parents he met a lion and he killed the lion and then he ate 
the honey that a swarm of bees made in its carcass. Uh, that is some time later. Right? Some time later, uh, he went back and he saw the lion, the dead lion, with this um, honey because of a swarm of bees settling in the body of the lion, dead lion. And he took the honey from the lion's carcass and in doing so, he made himself ceremonially unclean according to the ritual purity law given in Numbers 19 and Leviticus 11. So he went to touch a dead body, the lion. And then he went further to give some of the honey to his parents to eat. And he didn't tell them where he got the honey from. And again, by doing so, he caused his parents to become ceremonially unclean without their knowledge. So this Samson kind of disregarded his Nazarite vow. And the second thing that he uh, broke the vow was uh, a Nazarite must not cut their hair during the duration of their vow, uh, Numbers chapter 6, verse 5. And if you can remember a vague little detail, uh, there was a time when St. Paul in the book of Acts made a Nazarite vow, right? So he must not cut his hair. For Samson, he played with danger when he repeatedly placed himself in compromising situations. And in this case, he was telling Delilah about the truth of his strength. And he was telling misleading truths a few times before finally revealing the truth about his hair. And for him to reveal the truth, it shows this reckless attitude and a lack of seriousness about his divine mission. And Delilah betrayed him by getting his hair cut and that led to his capture by the Philistines, Judges chapter 16. So, besides breaking Nazarite vows, we see that Samson disobeyed other instructions God gave the Israelites. One is not to intermarry with the surrounding nations. God told that in Deuteronomy 7. But Samson married a Philistine woman from Timna. Right? 14 is Judges 14. And interestingly, the Bible says that his insistence to marry a Philistine was from the Lord. This is a very curious detail. Who was seeking an occasion to confront the Philistines who were ruling over Israel at that time. Chapter 14, verse 4. So this is a rare occasion in the Bible, right? where the Bible refers to a person's disobedient choice of action as from the Lord. See, the Bible says that Samson's insistence to marry a Philistine was from the Lord. Very interesting uh, way of putting it. It shows that the person's wrong action, right? Person's wrong action can fulfill God's will and promise. Right? His insistence to break the break God's law, marry a non, non-God's people, was from the Lord, seeking an occasion to confront the Philistines who were oppressing and ruling over Israel. So God took Samson's wrong action to fulfill his will and purpose. And it reflects the reciprocal relationship of a person's choice with God's will. Okay, so it shows this combination of a person's choice and at the same time, God's will. And God's will here is to deal with the Philistines who are oppressing Israel, as we saw uh, earlier on, yeah? Okay, that this was from the Lord. 
his insistence to marry the Philistine was from the Lord. So we have the, bal the mysterious balance. We always talk about choice, human choice, and God's will. So this works out the mysterious balance that a, hu a person's choice is his personal responsibility. And at the same time, it matches God's will for a specific purpose. Right? So a person's choice matches God's will, but the Bible makes it clear it is still the person's responsibility because that person chose it. God does not treat the person as a robot. In short, God in his sovereignty, God is sovereign, God is in control, right? No matter what we do, in his sovereignty, he used Samson's choice to be the occasion to spark off the Israelites' deliverance. So quite an interesting way of uh, working, which people tend to misunderstand God and think that, oh, God is controlling people. No, God is not controlling people. God is using people's choice, even if it is a bad one, to get the result, to work out the result he wants. So the next thing that uh, Samson did to break God's law was the prohibition of sexual immorality. Exodus 20 verse 14 says, no adultery. But he spends the night with a prostitute in Gaza, chapter 16, verse 1. And by doing so, he violated the laws prohibiting sexual immorality and prostitution. So besides breaking his Nazarite sorry, vows and forming inappropriate relationships, Samson committed other actions that were wrong as a person of God and also as a judge of Israel. Uh, the first thing we find is seeking personal vengeance, where he often acted out of personal vengeance rather than with the mindful purpose of delivering Israel. What he did was he captured th 300 foxes and then tied their tails together in pairs with torches and he set them loose in the Philistines' grain fields and burnt their crops. And this happened after his Philistine wife was given to another man. So he was quite petty. Uh, his wife was given away, so he went to destroy Philistine property. And it led to the Philistines going for a tit-for-tat reaction. They went to burn his wife and her father to death. And then, for their cruelty, Samson attacked them viciously and slaughtered many of them. So what the Chinese say, yuan yuan, en en yuan yuan, or whatever kind of thing. Huh? En yuan, okay? So you kill me, I kill your, your people, and then after that, they, they will kill your people, and, and so on. They non-stop, right? So that was Samson seeking personal vengeance and using his strength, abused his strength for personal grudges. So instead of consistently using his God-given strength to deliver Israel, he constantly used it to settle personal scores and demonstrate or abuse his power. It's like he was this arrogant boy man, huh? okay, showing that, oh, nothing is too hard for me and my strength. And it was not about God or his nation or his people. It was about how he felt and how he was being treated. He didn't like it, so he behaved in all these uh, ways to abuse his strength for personal grudges. Then as a judge and a Nazarite, Samson would be expected to uphold God's standard of holiness. Because he was a leader, he was a judge, he was a Nazarite, a holy person. But his actions demonstrated this complicated mix very complex, okay, of the carnal man, the man who, who lives like an ungodly person, anointed by God to accomplish an important purpose literally, and that was to deliver his people from enemy oppression. 
So Samson did all these things and we see God held Samson accountable. God didn't say, oh, because you are serving me, I will let you go. I close two eyes. No, God held Samson accountable in his loss of strength and his capture by the Philistines. You see, his strength was tied to his Nazarite vow, particularly the vow not to cut his hair. And when he revealed the secrets to Delilah, she got his hair cut. And his hair was the sign of his strength and God's presence. So the hair was gone. So his strength was gone. God's presence was gone. And this situation led the Lord to leave him and he lost his strength. And that was how the Philistines were finally able to capture and imprison this strong man. So God held him accountable with the loss of his strength and capture. And the next thing was the loss of his eyes and being put in prison to grind grain for the Philistines. So they gouged out his eyes and made him grind grain in prison. And his physical blindness symbolized his spiritual blindness and disobedience. Right? Physically blind, actually trying to show us he was spiritually blind and disobedient. And his imprisonment and forced labor were a direct result of his failure to keep his Nazarite vows and his involvement with Delilah. Another way God held him accountable was his humiliation and mockery by the Philistines. They mocked him and they celebrated his capture to showcase their triumph over him in their temple. And they said, oh, our God gave us victory over Samson. And then they made him perform to entertain them. So he became a clown to them, to be entertaining them. We see God holding Samson accountable through both personal and public consequences. The loss of his supernatural strength, his physical blindness, imprisonment, humiliation, and eventually his death. And to someone like Samson, what he went through would also have been a blow to his personal pride. Yeah, somebody like this so heroic to go through all this would really be a blow to his pride. But while in prison, his hair began to grow back and that symbolized potential for his strength to be restored. In that sense, his relationship with God to be returned to normal. And in his final moments, he prayed to God for strength one last time to bring judgment on the Philistines. And despite his failings, God listened to his prayer, his last prayer. So God still listened to him even though he had been unfaithful, right? And after his prayer, his final act was to pull down the pillars of the Philistine temple. What was special about the audience of the Philistine temple was the Philistine rulers were in the temple watching him perform when he pulled the temple down with his superhuman strength. And it killed him and many Philistines, including all the Philistine rulers. And the Bible says he killed many more when he died than while he lived. Now we may not realize the importance of the mention that the Philistine rulers were all in the temple. Okay? We may not realize, but what was significant in this moment and this act of Samson's life was when he killed the Philistine rulers, it crippled the Philistines' power to continue to oppress the Israelites. And so that was, you remember, God said that it was the beginning of the deliverance from the Philistines. Because in killing the people in the temple, he killed the rulers of the Philistines and that crippled their power. Because no rulers means the people cannot organize uh, 
themselves to oppress the Israelites. So we see that despite his personal failures, this act of destruction was a final judgment against the Philistines. It fulfilled Samson's role as a judge as well. Okay, but at the same time, it was his accountability where he died to do this last act, okay, that somehow three three things happened. Three things happened as a result of this. Huh? The judgment against the Philistines, Samson fulfilling his role as a judge to save Israel, and at the same time, accountability for the way he led his life in a very ungodly way. So God used Samson's personal regretful sacrifice as a significant victory over the Philistines. And it shows us that even flawed individuals can serve God's sovereign purpose. As I said just now, God is sovereign and God can even use sinful or sinful people, people who are flawed, to serve his purpose. We see Samson is this complex character who died a tragic hero in captivity. But even then, you know, the Hebrews writer includes him as one of the people commended for their faith with a future promise in Hebrews 11. So, despite and even through the interference of his carnal, that means he indulged in his physical senses and physical pleasures, the interference of his physical carnal human nature, God still went ahead to deliver Israel. You see, God cannot wait for all of us to be perfect and totally obedient before he fulfilled his good work for us. Otherwise, we might all become extinct. You know, if, if God waits for a person who is perfectly good and qualified, we will all be extinct, right? So God uses even sinful, broken, flawed people to accomplish his purpose for us. And once again, the Bible shows that God is not handicapped by a person's failure, even if that person is anointed, yeah, or the person's refusal to serve his or her purpose in the way that will be good for him or her. Remember the story of Pharaoh in Egypt, for example? Yeah, God still used Pharaoh for a purpose for God. But it is good for each one of each one of us, that we serve God's purpose for us by doing it right. So this is very important. Important for us to do right to serve God's purpose rather than let God do the, uh, the incredible thing of serving His purpose through our bad actions. Okay, Because when we do right, then we will not cause others, not cause others to be collateral damage of our poor choices. You see, God can work out good from our bad choices, but then there will be people who will be victims. You see, so we are causing suffering, we are causing bad things to other people, even though God ultimately works His good purpose. And then we should also do God's purpose by doing good uh, for ourselves, so that Personally, we may be spiritually formed towards our own eternal destiny. So that those are two important reasons why we should achieve God's purpose by doing good, doing right, rather than let God work the miraculous of uh, doing, achieving His purpose through our wrong actions. So we look further besides the Abimelech and Samson, we see the wrongdoings of the Israelites as a whole in Judges 19 to 21. We see that Israel's disobedience and lack of accountability to God as well as in watching out for each other, they did not watch out for each other, and that led to a serious internal problem. So they were not accountable to God, they were not accountable for each other. Right, and it became a serious internal problem. This was shown, highlighted in the last chapters of this book, right? 
and chapters 19 to 21. Actually, it's, uh, yeah. So we see immorality and lawlessness. What happened in chapter 17? Okay. Uh, uh, sorry. What happened was this uh, uh, Levite was traveling home to Bethlehem with his concubine. And he stopped overnight. This man offered him hospitality at the Benjamite town of Gibeah. And some of the wicked men of the city surrounded the house and demanded that the owner of the house brought the men out for them to have sex with him. And then the story ended up with them brutally raping the Levite's concubine. And it showed the depth of their moral decay. Right, God's people doing that. They were immoral and lawless and they behaved like the people of Sodom who demanded to have homosexual sex with Lot's visitors. That was in Genesis 19. Right, so this story shows God's people became as bad as the people of Sodom. And then God's people failed to uphold justice. This tribe of Benjamin refused to listen to the other tribes of Israel that wanted to put the perpetrators, the people who committed the crime, to death and purge the evil from Israel yeah, to make sure that it doesn't spread to other people. But the tribe refused to surrender the guilty men. And in fact, they mobilized their men to fight against the other Israelites in chapter 20. So it shows that they are, in other words, approving or condoning the wrong by protecting the, the people who committed wrong. So God held the nation accountable for how far they had deteriorated, went downhill in their identity as his holy people. And it happened through internal strife and civil war, the people of God fighting among themselves. God allowed this civil war to erupt between the tribe of Benjamin and the rest of Israel as a consequence of them protecting and, in other words, endorsing the guilty people's actions. And this first battle resulted in the Benjamites killing 22,000 Israelites. See, so many people died. Collateral damage because they refused to uphold justice. And then you have massive casualties because the battles resulted in a lot of lost lives, not just the Israelites, but also the Benjamites. In fact, by the end of that civil war, people fighting their own brothers, right? the tribe of Benjamin was nearly annihilated, nearly exterminated. Only 600 men survived. So you see, a few people's wrong behavior like the Sodomites resulted in thousands of deaths. And finally, the Israelites realized their sorry situation. And they mourned this near loss of a whole tribe of Benjamin. And they went to try to restore the tribe by providing wives for the surviving 600 men. And so they were accountable, but once again, God was merciful. God did not destroy the whole of Israel, especially that tribe of Benjamin, for becoming immoral and lawless like the pagan neighbors. God allowed the tribe to survive and be restored. So you see, God disciplined them, but God was still merciful. And in the closing chapters of the book of Judges, the Israelites showed how far they had deviated in the promised land in their idolatry, uh, Judges, Judges 17 to 18, their moral decay and justice, Judges 19 to 21. And they showed this lack of accountability to God as well as to each other through what we have just seen in Gibeah. And the tribe of Benjamin failed to uphold justice and it led to a devastating civil war with massive casualties and nearly wiped out that tribe. And then the surviving Israelites tried to restore the tribe 
and it showed a recognition of their collective responsibility and the consequences of their actions. So they realized they have a responsibility as a people of God. You see, we cannot say, I don't care, not my business, let God judge them. You know, it's not my business, it's between them and God. Nowadays, a lot of people like to say that, between them and God. But here, you see, they realize that they are responsible. So even though his people were inconsistent and unfaithful as a covenant people, God remained consistent. He called them to account through judgment, through discipline, and then he restored them in his compassion and mercy when they realized they're wrong. But remember, a lot of people suffered in the process. That's why we must remember it is better to do right. To obey is better than sacrifice. Remember 1 Samuel 15, yeah? To obey is better than sacrifice. And to heed is better than the fat of rams. That means do good rather than do bad and then apologize with sacrifices. Even though God is willing to forgive. Then we move on to Eli and his sons in 1 Samuel chapter 2. And this was towards the end of the era of the judges where Eli was both priest and judge with two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, who were corrupt priests. 1 Samuel 2, 12, the Bible says his sons were scoundrels, very direct. These were terrible people. They had no regard for God the Lord. So Leviticus 22, 1 to 2, already God said to Moses, tell Aaron and his sons, treat with respect the sacred offerings the Israelites consecrate to me, so they will not profane my holy name. I am the Lord. So God said already, treat my sacrifices with respect. But Eli's sons treated God and his suffering offering with contempt by insisting on taking meat from the worshippers before the fat was burned up. And we know that fat is supposed to be offered to God, not to the priests. And here they very disrespectfully just snatched God's fat offerings. And Eli rebuked his sons for their sins, but they did not listen. They were no longer rebukable or correctable even by their father because Eli had not been consistent in his attitude toward their sin against God. On one hand, he rebuked them and then on the other hand, he, he himself ate the meat that they disrespectfully took from the worshippers. So this man of God told him, why do you scorn my sacrifice and offering that I prescribed for my dwelling? Why do you honour your sons more than me? By fattening yourselves on the choice, that means the fat of every offering made by my people Israel. So God was saying that Eli was honouring his sons more than honouring God. Because Eli participated with his sons in eating, and fattening himself on the meat that belonged to God. In other words, Eli condoned. He approved. He scolded with the mouth, but he ate with the mouth at the same time. Right? So he was not showing by his action that they were wrong. And God held the priest family accountable through prophecy and eventual judgment. He sent a prophet to warn Eli of the judgment because of his son's sins and Eli's own failure to restrain them. So even the, the priest family was judged by God. And God's judgment was fulfilled when the Israelites were defeated by the Philistines once again. And Eli's sons were killed in battle. Eli also died when he heard the news and the Ark of God's covenant was captured. The Israelites were defeated and they lost 30,000 foot soldiers. 
Eli's story illustrates the failure of even the priesthood, the spiritual leaders, the teachers, to maintain their spiritual role and light in Egypt, uh, sorry, in Israel, in the time of Israel's apostasy. So a very bad situation. Even the priests were like that. So we want to look at the extent of Israel's apostasy problem. How big, how serious was this problem? Okay, Israel's was a specially chosen people and basically everyone did as he saw fit, right? In Judges, uh, this was because in those days, Israel had no king. Uh, later on, we'll see even if they had a king, what does it mean? Does it mean that the people will not do as they see fit? Okay, but for now, we just look at Judges without a king. And so, on their own, God's people behaved just like the pagan people. They are God's people, but they are no different, so-called, from non-Christians. Christians no different from non-Christians. Every level of God's people was prone to be as carnal, you know, enjoying the physical pleasures, and ungodly as the peoples they lived among. And they, these God's people included Abimelech, son of a formal judge, and he represents an individual with drive, individual with ambition. But ambition was not for God. Then we have Samson, a judge, who was an anointed individual or leader, but also carnal and ungodly. Then you have the men and the tribe of Benjamin, that is the community, also ungodly. Then you have Eli and his sons. They were priests. They were religious leaders, also ungodly. So every level of God's people was just no-no. Even those considered leaders strayed from God's values and character as a holy people. So they were not holy. They integrated idols with their worship of God. So they worshiped God, but they also combined idols in their worship. We have the story of Micah and the mother giving us an insight into the common people's worship, right? Common people, how they worship. And they worship idols at the same time that they use the name of God. Yeah, so they talk about God with their mouth, but at the same time, they also have their own idols. Mika's mother. Mika stole her silver and then he admitted to her that he stole and she said, oh, bless you in, in the name, the Lord bless you. Right, so by saying the Lord bless you, after the son stole silver and then she went to curse the person who stole it, she was now saying, God bless you. So this is kind of like an inconsistent Christian, inconsistent person of God. And then after that, that's not the end. She went on to consecrate her silver to the Lord for her son to make a carved image and a cast idol. So she said, I make this idol for God. Yeah? Consecrate the silver, that means dedicate it to God, to make an idol. So you can see very clearly, this was apostasy, turning away from God. And then they are combining or integrating their worship of God with idols that she was going to make for her son. So there you have, they worship God, and then they also have the idols there to worship. That's, that's what's happening here. right? And then once they make the Idols, they put a shrine. Shrine is like a small temple in Mika's house together with an ephod and some more idols. So a lot of idols in Mika's house. And then Mika, following the installation of the idols, he went to install a Levite to be his personal priest. And he said, now I know the Lord will be good to me. Again, using God's name, and he knows God will be good to him. Why? because the Levite has become his personal priest. So he believed God would bless him because he has this Levite as his priest in his house full of idols. You see that these people, they really mix up their worship. 
And he and his mother represent the ordinary people, ordinary family, worshipping idols even as they talk about God. You know, and ironically, God made a covenant with them that they should only worship him and have no other gods or make any idols to worship. So you can see, indeed, everyone did as he saw fit. Okay, They all did what they wanted. And they said, that's God as well. I have God in my heart. And then you have the next story, the men from the tribe of Dan. They were offered hospitality at Mika's house for one night. And they ended up stealing his idols to worship at their tribe level. Steal the idols for the tribe to worship. And they also enticed the Levites that he employed as his personal priest. Come, be the priest for our whole tribe. Isn't it better? More people. Ah. It shows that even the religious leaders in the figure of the Levites were doing their own thing. Remember, everyone did as he saw fit. Even the priests, the Levites, were doing their own thing instead of following God's commands. Then we see that Gideon and his family of Abizrites, community of Abizrites from the tribe of Manasseh, worshipped Baal and Asherah. His father, Yoash, had an altar to Baal and an Asherah pole in the house. And what happened was the house became a house temple where the men of the town worshipped. So again, you see a whole community worshipping idols with God and the house was a temple. So we see the Israelites, they lacked spiritual, effective spiritual worship. <clears throat> like Joshua and the elders of his day. For these people, their elders did not appear to have any spiritual impact to keep Israel on track with God. Even the judges were not spiritual leaders. They did not unite the people together to focus on restoring God's position in the center of life, like Joshua's time. They, these judges simply filled in the gaps to fight for and maintain the freedom and the survival of the people whenever they got into trouble. So prevented the enemies from totally destroying the Israelites. And the Israelites failed to think of, failed to plan for, failed to train and appoint leadership succession. No leaders like Joshua to take over. They were just happy to have their elders. Then we see Avimelech was not a judge appointed by God. He did not lead or fight for Israel against the enemies. And he just grabbed the chance to be king and make himself great and important. And sometimes that's what people do in church. They do things to make themselves important. But his supporters also did not distinguish between right and wrong. They just supported Abimelech because they were related by blood and they had benefits. So they did not stand by firm principles of right and wrong when they supported him and they killed his brothers to set himself up as king. And so we see God's people may be immoral to act by wrong values. Now, the only person who stood and spoke against Abimelech's wrong was that brother who managed to survive. And he stayed far, far out of reach to speak out against Abimelech's wrong. Just now we saw that he had a, he pronounced a curse. right? And this situation highlights two tragic but critical points. When wrong is embraced by the group, so the whole group allows wrong, and wrong becomes the rule of might is right. Because we are the big group, we are the mighty group, wrong is okay, it's right. The majority get to decide what is right or acceptable. Even if it's wrong, it's okay because we are the big number. And then anyone who wants to speak against the wrong is in the minority. So either shut up or do it with fear for your life. We can kill you. And he is a minority and he has to be ready to run for his life after he speaks out against the wrong. So this is the sad but tragic reality. And God was silent for the three years that Abimelech was king, but did not mean he had stopped existing or he did not care. 
God allows time to work with human events and relationships. And he allows consequences to work out over time. And finally, he called Abimelech and the men who supported him to account. So this interlude of Israel's history when Abimelech seized power and set himself up as king illustrates the confusion, the disharmony and disorder among God's people when they fail to have a proper system for successive spiritual leadership. No effective leader, and so everyone did as they saw fit and all this mess came up. And due to the lack of effective spiritual leadership to establish right and guard against deviation, distortion and com contamination, they failed to maintain spiritual purity. You don't have effective leader spiritually, then what happens next is you will not maintain spiritual purity. Because they can't prevent the contamination and promise of the right faith and obedience at the personal and individual level. There's nobody to rebuke them, to stop them. So in time, the whole community, and we see that with Gideon's town, and even the whole tribe, we see that with the Danite tribe, and even the religious leaders themselves, the Levite and Eli's family, yeah, uh, turned from God. They went to disobey God. And people believe what they wanted to believe about God. So they can say that this is God, I'm doing it for God. And they practice their own thing. Everyone did as he saw fit. And that's what people still do today. So the people failed to maintain spiritual consistency. Right? No effective spiritual leadership. Uh, don't maintain spiritual purity. So they don't maintain spiritual consistency. Families, like Gideon's family and Micah's families, the tribes, right? They all strayed and lost their sense of accountability to each other, for each other, to check on each other, and also towards God. So what the people did not see was that they did not learn. Okay, so I'm saying this very unusual thing. What they didn't see was that they are not learning from their experiences and God's word. See, they were a spiritual people. There was no doubt of this, that they were spiritual. They knew about God. They talked about God. And they say things that relate life to God. For example, Gideon knew, you know, the angel that went to, went to choose Gideon as a leader to be a judge. He then knew God performed wonders to bring his ancestors out of Egypt. But he didn't know why the Lord, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? And then abandoned them to the Midianites. He didn't understand why God allowed the, the enemies to overcome them. After all, God set them free from enemies all the way out of Egypt until here. So he just didn't understand, but he could talk about God. And you know, for us as Christians, when things like that happen, Christians can lose faith. Christians can say, if God is supposed to be with us, how come all this happens among us? And then they will lose their faith and backslide and stop being Christian. That is what they could become. But you see, they absorb the beliefs and the works of the other gods. And they blended all these other gods with their knowledge of God and their own beliefs. So it was a whole roja of a mixed up, compromised testimony and identity as a holy, but no longer holy people. Yeah, they're supposed to be holy, but they're no longer holy. We see familiarity with God became religious practice, religiosity. And they took their relationship with God for granted. And it led to an insidious, insidious hardening of heart. Judges 2.19, where they were being stubborn and set in their ways, so they failed to see their need to continue to change and maintain holiness. 
And that is the equivalent of continual progressive sanctification for Christians. They just couldn't see their need to change because they were stubborn and they had become set in their ways. And so God's people can include people who behave just like the pagan peoples. Same way, Christians can show the same actions and values as the non-Christians who are unsaved. Basically, everyone simply did what was right in their own eyes. And they didn't caution or rebuke each other. And this was unlike the time, you know, in session 17 that we looked at. In the past, the elders of the nine and a half tribes, they confronted the two and a half tribes. Yeah. They confronted the two and a half tribes who built an altar at the Jordan River. That one we explored in session 17, where there was accountability. And in this way, what happens now is they became inconsistent with the standard and the type of people they should be. So, God's people became so corrupt in their thinking and understanding that they were no longer able to see, no longer to, able to acknowledge and change their wrong ways. And no matter what God did for them, you know, they repeatedly, they could no longer respond to him because they were losing sensitivity, hardening in their heart and becoming rigid and blind in their spiritual sight, just like Samson. Just like Samson. So that's why we went, they went into cycles of apostasy. Right? So that's where we see the extent of Israel's apostasy problem. So in summary, to round off today's session, right, we see that God is consistent in his love, his mercy, and compassion when dealing with people, including his chosen people during the dark age of apostasy in the period of the judges. How is God consistent? When they obeyed, he helped them fight battles and he saved them. And this serves a double-edged purpose. Yeah, When God helped them, it, on one hand, it carried out justice against the, peop the enemies that were defeated because of their sin and lack of repentance. And the second purpose is it blessed the people of Israel. So God is sovereign enough to achieve two things in their obedience and it's for their good. When they disobeyed, he fought against them as he helped them fight against the unrepentant. So fighting against them is just like fighting against the unrepentant, which they are. Yes. And he did this by withdrawing his protection and cover over them, just like the unrepentant enemies would. God also did not protect or cover them so that they were in turn naturally defeated by their stronger enemies. They were not big, they were not strong as a people. They could not defeat their enemies on their own. See, so God let them suffer to teach them a lesson to see that they needed him and to call them back to himself. And this was teaching them dependence on him and the fact that he is their true God. And he is their true God. And besides that, he also used their defeats and oppressive treatment by, by their enemies to test them if they would learn their lesson and return to him. And finally, he used their experiences with the enemies to teach and train them in warfare. So for their disobedience, he disciplined them and he still worked for their good, showing his mercy love and compassion is consistent even in their sin and violation of their covenant god is still so good to them and god alone knows all he is doing and accomplishing god alone sees the minutest details and the overall scheme and place for all the things and events that happen 
in order to work out his master plan and final destiny for each person. So for us, and for many people, we read, we may not understand, we may not see, because we miss all the little, little details, and we miss all the connections. But God is still working. Yeah, God is still doing His work for our good. And that's why even though we don't understand, that's where we need to apply faith. Okay, faith that God knows what he's doing and he's doing the best. Even when his people act as if they do not have responsibility or accountability, he will continue to hold each person, each group, each community, each nation accountable. So we cannot say, I don't know, I'm ignorant. We have to know, we have to learn God's word so that we learn we have to be accountable for the right and wrong because God will deal with them, God will deal with us, as all of us deserve. Now, whether it takes place in their lifetime or after, okay, some people in a certain, inverted commas, privilege, accountability or, or consequences happen in their, outside their lifetime, but that is not, of, not all the time, right? Still, God will hold all of us account, accountable. And through everything, okay, come what may, whatever may happen, God is still consistent in his character. God is consistent in his relationship and responses with people. Both his people and those who have not yet acknowledged him as their own saviour and God. That means even with the non-Christians or with the pagans, God is consistent in his response to them. And God is consistent, is working out his final purpose and master plan. Right? So God is consistent and it is even in times of darkness and trouble, God calls us to trust in him and walk with him faithfully and in obedience. Regardless how much or how little we know or understand what he is doing, we know or understand what he is doing. The Bible story really tells how consistent God is if only we understand him. And so, to round off, the challenge is for us as God's people to see his consistency from Genesis to Revelation and strive to attain his consistency. Be like your God in every aspect possible. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, that your word, so many stories, so many things happening, so many details, but you are consistent. You are still the good God who treats us with love, mercy, and compassion. And even when we are wrong, you do not destroy us, but you discipline us. And in your discipline, you continue to make a way possible for us to turn back to you and learn and practice to be the kind of people you want us to be. Help us, O oh Lord, therefore, to learn to be obedient and to strive to be consistent. We pray and commit all these things to you in Jesus' name. Amen.